last and final prophet of Allah. He was a mercy unto the universe. Peace and blessings be on Al Mustafa. So he began this perfect man. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you and welcome to Hadith Principles. Uh, in Hadith Principles we discuss the Hadith, the second source of Islamic teaching. And we have our uh, panel with us, uh, our guest uh, Ayman from United States, Muhammad from Egypt, and our other Muhammad from the United States. Welcome guys. Inshallah, this will be uh, interesting and beneficial to everybody. Bi'idhnillah, God willing. A lot of people think that, oh, I don't have to uh, obey what the Prophet Muhammad told me. I only have to obey what Allah said in the Quran. And so they think that the Sunnah is not necessary or it's not necessary to read the Hadith or understand them or obey what's in them. But in the Quran itself, God Almighty told us to obey the Prophet Muhammad. In Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 32 of the Quran, Allah Almighty says, Qul wa fin uh, Say, uh, O Muhammad, command them, uh, obey God, obey Allah, and the Messenger. And if they turn away, truly God does not love those who reject the truth, a kafirin, or who deny the truth. And so in this verse, Allah is commanding the Prophet to teach us and to say to the people, uh, you have to obey Allah and you have to obey the Prophet. It's not a choice. You can't obey Allah and disobey the Prophet Muhammad. And then if they reject that, if they turn away, then Allah says he does not love the kafirin. That means they're rejecting Islam. And so if you're to disobey the Prophet Muhammad, you are rejecting Islam and you are in disobedience to the Qur'an, very clearly. Uh, in another verse in chapter 4 in Surah An-Nisa, uh, verse 59, Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu atiyu Allah wa atiyu rasul wa ul al-amri minkum fin tana'za'tum fi shay'in farudduhu illallahi wa rasul O you who have attained faith or iman, belief in God, in the Qur'an, Obey God and obey the Messenger, as well as those among you who are in authority. That means the appointed leaders of the community or the leaders in knowledge and faith. And so the appointed leaders are our, our, our government and people in authority in the community, appointed uh, to, by the community, for example, for different affairs, to uh, run our affairs, and the ulama or people of knowledge who have the authority, who have inherited the teaching of Islam from the Prophet Muhammad and are passing that on to us. We have to pay attention to what they say. And so it's not possible that we could claim we're following the Qur'an, but we're not following the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, specifically his words or his deeds. In a very important verse, in chapter 33, Surah Al-Ahzab, Verse 36. Whenever Allah and His Messenger have decided or decreed any matter, it is not for the believing man or the believing woman to claim they have a choice as far as they themselves are concerned in that matter. And so Allah says, وَمَنْ يَعْسِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُهُ Whoever re uh, disobeys and rebels against the commandment of God and His Messenger, فَقَدْ ذَلَّ ذَلَالًا مُبِينًا They have gone clearly far astray. And so it's clear from the Qur'an that we have to obey the sunnah or the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad uh, in, uh, also in Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاءَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ We've only sent 
prophets or messengers so that they may be obeyed by the will of Allah. And so that's the role of prophets and, and messengers is that they command us and we obey them. And when Allah said, bi idni Allah, by, by Allah's will, that means if Allah permits us and guides us, then we will obey the Prophet. But if we are uh, corrupted in our hearts and close our hearts and we don't listen, and then Allah will seal our hearts and we will disobey Him and we will reject Him. We will not listen to the Prophet. So following the Sunnah or the Hadith of the Prophet is a test for us uh, whether we are Obeying the Prophet is a test whether we have belief in God. And so if we don't follow the Hadith, then we are denying the role of the Prophet and Messenger as given uh, to us in the Qur'an. Uh, the Prophet himself said, Alaykum bis sunnati wa sunnat al-khulafa rashidin al-mahdiyin ba'di. Min ba'di. Uh, you have to obey my sunnah, that is my way, or my practice, and that of the rightly guided successors or leaders of the Muslim community. Those are Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali, the four rightly guided khulafa or successors of the Prophet Muhammad after him, who were his closest uh, companions and disciples and who became the leaders of the community and guided us. So, of course, they only followed what they had learned from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And they were also ulul amr, they were leaders appointed in authority among us, as we, Allah also told us in the Qur'an. And so, when a leader of the community is following the teaching of the Qur'an and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, then we are requi requi we required to obey them, inshallah, by the will of Allah. Uh, and so it is without doubt in Islam that we're required to follow authentic hadiths that tell us the sayings or doings of the Prophet Muhammad. In fact, the entire Muslim ummah in the time of the companions agreed about that. And so on numerous occasions uh, during the lifetime of the companions, various companions taught by the words of the Prophet Muhammad and taught the Muslim community, and no companion ever objected and said, no, we don't teach the words of the Prophet Muhammad or convey them, we only convey the sunnah. Uh, many of the companions themselves, the Sahaba themselves learned hadith from other Sahaba. So the Sahaba, all of them are considered uh, in Islam to be adul, that they are trustworthy, and when they talk about the Prophet Muhammad, of course, they are faithful Muslims and we listen to them and believe what they tell us. And so they themselves listen to other companions. The companions used to have jobs. They used to be out, for example, outside of town they would have farms. They would go out and work all day. Then they would come and they would say to the other companions, basically, what did I miss? Did the Prophet say something while I was gone? And they would tell him what the Prophet wasallam, taught. So the Prophet was in the mosque with his companions really day and night. And so not everybody had the chance to hear him. And so people would learn from them. And also in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, people would come to Medina, the Prophet's city, from faraway areas and lands. And they would learn Islam and they would believe in the Prophet Muhammad. And then he would send them back to their people to teach Islam to them. Now did those people memorize the Quran? No. The Prophet would instruct them, sometimes orally, and sometimes in written form, he would have written for them some basic teachings of Islam, and he would tell them to go back and teach your people. And so they would tell the people whatever they saw and did from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. So nobody said, oh, well, we're not going to pray the way Prophet Muhammad taught you. We're only going to follow the Quran. No, of course, nobody did that. They learned their prayers and every other Islamic belief from those companions. So the companions actually had sahifas or pieces of paper or parchment. There was not actually paper, it was actually parchment, leather, or some other kind of uh, writing from the Prophet Muhammad giving basic beliefs or practices, how to pray or how to fast. Nobody said, oh, we're not going to take this. Of course, whatever the Prophet Muhammad uh, gave them, they accepted that and they were uh, as believers. 
Um, also, the Sahaba were very sincere and diligent in conveying the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad to the next generation. Uh, in the last few years of the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, Muslims ex expanded from being a few hundred to being a few thousand. Then in the time of Fatimaka or the conquest of Makkah, maybe 10,000 men. Uh, within uh, a couple of years later, at the final pilgrimage, there were 100,000 Muslims in attendance. And within a few years after that, uh, millions of people had entered into Islam. All of them learned Islam through the companions who taught whatever they knew. Most of the companions didn't memorize the whole Qur'an. They learned to pray and fast and the other beliefs of Islam from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. As Islam expanded all over the world, it became necessary to be very careful in what was conveyed from the Prophet Muhammad. And so the Muslims developed what we call critical scholarship, and that is a naqd, or the criti hadith criticism. And it was the first time in history that to be a critic of religion was actually a good thing. Normally in most religions, up until modern times, if you criticize some teaching of that religion, so if you said in the time of, in the Middle Ages, uh, the church taught you something and said, well, you know, I don't think that teaching is authentic. I don't find that in the Bible or in the teaching of Jesus. You'll be burnt at the stake. You'll be killed. <clears throat> and that was true of most religions. But in Islam, to be a critic was to be the highest level of authority. So if a person came and said, the Prophet Muhammad taught this and that, they would say, wait a minute. How do we know that? Where did you get that from? Who told you that? And they would examine that. And so Islam really paid attention to the scholarship necessary to authenticate the sunnah. We're going to go for a, a break and we'll be back shortly. Assalamu alaikum. Muhammad is the last and final prophet of Allah. Brothers and sisters, in particular brothers, husbands, divorce is the last resort. Even when I was given the topic, the art of divorce, I was thinking, why are we talking about a divorce? As they say in management, do you take serious decisions when you are angry? Mm. No one is taking a very serious decision yes. in his life, yeah. maybe in his business, while you are angry. A divorce happened in every six minutes. We are not talking about enjoying the divorce, but we are talking about certain steps uh, to be followed in order to avoid divorce or minimize the possibility of divorce or minimize the consequences of divorce. Any divorce taking place have many ill effects. So we would like to minimize those ill effects. Assalamualaikum. Welcome back to Hadith Principles. Uh, before the break, we were talking about how important it is to obey the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that the role of the Prophet in Islam, of any Prophet, but especially the final Prophet, the role of the Prophet is that he should be obeyed. So the Prophet is supposed to command and we obey him, obey obedience to the Prophet. And that's what's clearly taught to us in the Qur'an. So if we're going to obey the Qur'an, we have to obey the Prophet Muhammad. Now, the companions learn from the Prophet Muhammad. If the Prophet Muhammad came, uh, imagine yourself, you were there that time, and the Prophet came to you and said, I want you to pray this way. Are you going to say, no, because it's not in the Qur'an? Of course not. When people became Muslims, they would come from far away through the desert. They would come to Medina. They would go to the mosque. They would see the people praying. And they would pray the way they saw. And so, uh, from the Prophet, we got the how to practice Islam. How to understand it. From them, the Sahaba. The Sahaba are the Prophet's companions. Whoever was a Muslim 
and lived in the time of the Prophet Muhammad and saw him and believed in him. Now, the Sahaba didn't only teach the next generation. The Sahaba taught other Sahaba. So maybe I saw the Prophet Muhammad one time, but a lot of time maybe I, I, I would go back to my own country, my own home, and we would learn from some Sahaba who were the elders who had become Muslims before us and had learned in detail. So the Sahaba learned from other Sahaba. And then, of course, in the next generation, anybody who became a Muslim from the Sahaba's time, uh, are the Tabi'un, the second generation, the followers, they learned Islam at the hands of the Sahaba. They learned and they never said it. The Sahaba said, this is how you pray in Islam uh, or this is how you fast. They never said, oh, well, it's not in the Quran. So the Sahaba, of course, taught them. And the Tabi'un, of course, also taught the next generation and the next generation uh, on and on. And that's where we received, of course, the Hadith. It came in a very natural way. And if you imagine that you lived at that time, that's exactly what would have happened. Just like you learned Islam today, you learn, first of all, from example, from people, and then later on you learn in a formal way and you, know, you read and wrote and maybe got a test. <laughs> but at first you just learned it very naturally, inshallah. So our panel is here to help us in our discussion and understanding, inshallah. Okay, uh, yes, Brother Muhammad. Uh, dear Sheikh, uh, since you uh, talk about the the role of the Prophet وسلم, and that he was sent to explain to us the message, my question is that uh, is explaining the message, well, the only role of the Prophet وسلم, or in other words, the only role of the Hadith, is it possible that the Hadith adds something or originates some rules? Yeah, that's really excellent. And yes, somebody might say, well, the Prophet's role was to explain. And of course, in the first episode, we talked about that the Prophet's role was explaining the Qur'an. But in this, this episode, we read some verses that said uh, the Prophet was only sent to be obeyed. And that's different. So if the Prophet commanded you something, your job is to obey. And so you can't have a ta or obedience unless the, the Prophet has a role. Because it would say, Ati Allah, obey Allah, and obey the Messenger. And so if, if the Messenger tells you something, it's not the words of Allah, you still have to obey it. And then there was even a verse that said, Ulul Amr Minkum, that is, people in authority. That is, if Omar tells us to do something, we have to do it. If Omar is in obedience to the Qur'an and Sunnah, then we have to obey our leaders in authority. So if you have a mosque, for example, and you're the imam of the mosque, uh, and uh, y the mosque, of course, it uses electricity, but you know, you, it, it will cost a lot of money and be very wasted. So we have to tell our brothers and sisters of the mosque, as the imam or the leader of the mosque, please, brothers, don't waste electricity, turn the lights out, uh, don't turn the air conditioner up high. You know, and so they have to obey those things. And so in Islam, we had to obey our khulafa, our leaders, and whoever is in knowledge and authority in the community, we have to obey. And so, uh, it, there's nothing in the Qur'an that tells people to turn off the light in the mosque. That's following a principle of Islam, not wasting uh, the money, but using it and benefiting and not wasting our resources. And so, the imam of the mosque tells us something we have to obey. It's in harmony with Islam. And so, the Prophet told us many things that we have to obey in the Qur'an and in the Hadith. Some, most things in the Hadith have some relationship to verses of the Qur'an, but there are many things that do not have any direct relationship at all to uh, a particular verse of the Holy Qur'an. Okay. Yes, I have a question, please. Yes, Brother Ayman. Uh, how do scholars know the difference between a weak narration and a strong narration? Yeah. Well, see, that's exactly what this class is about, the Hadith principles. We have principles. Uh, Allah blessed the Ummah. And he promised that he is going to preserve this message. And it is a true miracle that Islam is preserved in word and in its meaning. And that is by, you know, Allah's decree. He brought human beings to this earth who played a role in preserving the Hadith for us. And we're going to be talking about that in the Hadith principles. And one thing is, 
that it's always possible for anything, anybody to make up any story. So we, we heard recently, for example, people uh, making uh, pictures or cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad or, or saying things about him. Well, are those authentic? You're making a picture. What, what is the relationship between Prophet Muhammad and this picture? Where do you get your information? So are you just making this up? Yes, you're making it up. People can say anything about anyone making it up. So it's possible for somebody to say a lie. So the ulama played a very careful role of criticizing these hadiths, making sure that anybody who tried to falsely attribute something to Prophet Muhammad, that that would be exposed so that we will be confident. And so that's what this whole class is about, these principles we need to distinguish what is authentic and what is not authentic. I have a question. Yes. Uh, regarding the obedience of uh, Allah and His Messenger, these are unconditional. Yes. And you said that it's conditional for the uh, ulul amr that are not following, uh, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu If they don't follow him, and you know this for a fact, as a common person, what should you do? Yeah. Well, you notice in that verse it said, Atiyu Allah, obey Allah. <coughs> it said, Atiyu Rasul, obey the Messenger. It didn't say, Atiyu ulul amr. It said, Wa. And that is when they are following Allah and the Messenger. In Islam, if anybody commands you what is your duty in the Quran or Sunnah, you're ob obligated to follow them. If a little child comes to me, an elder person, and tells me, it's prayer time, why don't you go and pray? I have to do that. And if somebody commands you to do something which is haram, you're not allowed to do that. And so... If your parents, if anybody commands you something, you're not allowed to disobey the teaching of Islam. That means the commandments of Islam, inshallah. Uh, and so it's conditional that uh, you, when somebody tells you what is right, you do it. It's not actually, it's like you're a soldier in the army. And they command you to go kill civilians, innocent people. You're not allowed to obey that commandment. Uh, you can't do something that is forbidden. Uh, and sometimes in Islam, to save your life. So somebody commands you, uh, I want you to uh, kiss the cross. That's what they would do. The Christians would gather up Muslims and kill them and make them kiss the cross if they want to live. So in Islam, you're allowed to you know, deny Islam. You believe in Islam, but to save your life, you're allowed to, to deny it. But your heart is full of iman or faith in Islam, inshallah. Yes, brother. Uh, dear Sheikh, you, you have taught us the, something what's called the, uh, the Sahaba are all Udul. Uh, uh, does this mean that uh, it's not possible that a Sahabi misquotes the Prophet Sallam or uh, even tells a, a lie? Or uh, this may be limited to certain areas, certain uh, uh, issues. Uh -huh. Can you please uh, shed light on this issue? Yes, that's very, uh, actually very excellent question. The Sahaba were human beings. And even in the Qur'an, it's mentioned that they were different levels. Some of them were the highest level of really competing together in good works and practice of Islam, and others were less so. Some of them were very new to Islam. Some of them only became Muslim in the last uh, few months of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, while others had been Muslims for 20 years or more, and had struggled and sacrificed greatly for Islam. Some of the Sahaba were great scholars, Others were just ordinary people. They weren't great scholars. They were honest people. They, didn't make, they ever did anything wrong or made a mistake. But they would never lie about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They weren't hypocrites who would falsely teach something. So you wouldn't expect, for example, a trustworthy and faithful, pious Muslim today who is knowledgeable about Islam to lie to you and say, um, actually in Islam there's nothing about uh, pork being forbidden, you know, you would be surprised that they would do that. Or they said, there's nothing in the sunnah about a man wearing gold. They would be lying, and of course you would know that because you have ac access to, to the books about that. But that would be very unusual. And a, so a person who did that would obviously would, 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 would be disqualified from teaching anybody about Islam. Well, the Sahaba were all qualified to teach something about Islam. They all knew about the oneness of Allah. And they all believed sincerely in the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. And they didn't convey to people falsehoods. Now, sometimes they made mistakes. So the Sahaba themselves, if they heard somebody say a hadith, 
and they had a question, they would take it to some of the other more learned Sahaba, or they would ask, have anybody else heard this hadith? And somebody else said, yes, I heard the hadith that same way. Or actually, I heard the Prophet say it this way, and this is exactly what happened. So they would themselves verify the uh, uh, authenticity and the exact wordings of the, of the hadith. And so we know this itself, and these actually, these discussions are actually preserved in the hadith today. Um, I guess that's what we have time for today. This is Hadith Principles. Inshallah, may Allah Almighty let us benefit and learn our religion from its authentic sources. Barakallahu fikum. May Allah bless all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Muhammad is the last and final prophet of Allah. He was a mercy unto the universe. Peace and blessings be on Al Mustafa. So he began this perfect man, sending his word across the land, leading only by his son and the Quran, the word of Allah, he brought the to this cruel world, our beloved prophet Muhammad.